According to scripture, the world system arrayed against God is steadily fading away. It is in the process of a self-destruction that will lead in the end to eternal judgment. But because this world is not our home and we just are passing through, believers have a different future, don't we? We are bound for glory. Future glory is the focus of the next part of Romans chapter 8, a section that we begin today. What we will learn in the next couple of weeks is the wonderful truth that in heaven we will be with Christ and we will be like him. That's the clear teaching of 1 John 3, 2, when it says, Beloved, now are we children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a day that will be. And what a great way to start today's message, a message that will bless your heart and change your life if you will take heed to what God is going to reveal to you today from his word. Let's ask God to bless us as we begin today. Thank you, Father God, for the privilege of being here again. Thank you for your word, which is forever established in heaven. Thank you so much that by taking heed thereto, we are guided, we are led, we are cleansed. Father, all the things that we need, you have provided for us in this living book. And I pray, Father God, you'd help us to see the Bible as your word. Father God, help us to make application. Father, help us to be challenged. Help us to be changed. Help us to be better for having spent time together in the scriptures. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to see you again today. Pastor Doug Carlson coming from Grace Missionary Church. I have my Bible open to Romans chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Just two verses again this week. But this text is very important to us. And I want to read it for you. And then we'll, we'll dive right in. Romans 8, verses 17 and 18. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Remember, we're just coming off of that marvelous text on the adoption uh, of, of the children of God into his family. And so in verse 16, it said, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And then what I read today, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and so on. Now the word if in verse 17 means because. So the teaching here is that because all believers are being led by the Holy Spirit, verse 14, because all believers have been adopted into God's family, verse 15, and because we have the inner witness of the Spirit in verse 16, we are children of God. And if children, we are heirs. And it is this spiritual inheritance that I want to talk to you about today in our brief but important passage. And the first thing I want you to see is the type of our inheritance. The type of our inheritance. What is he talking about um, in verse 17 and 18? You see, you may have received an inheritance at some time in your life, and so we understand that, right? We have parents or other family members who've passed away and left us something in their will, and we understand that we are their heirs. But I guarantee you, you've never received anything like what God is talking about here, because believers have an inheritance from God. We actually have an inheritance from the God of the universe, the one who created us, the one who sustains us, the one who owns everything in the universe. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And of course, beyond that, even into the universe, the galaxy, God owns it all. And like adoption itself, as we saw in the book of Ephesians last week, God's largesse, God's gift, God's love for us, wasn't a second thought with him. It was ordained from eternity past. Matthew quotes Jesus in his uh, gospel recording these words. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Here we go. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Did you see it? Isn't that exciting? Our eternal glory was prepared for us from the very foundation of the world. Now other verses in scripture make it clear that in a real sense, Jesus doesn't just give us this inheritance, all the things that, that we can read about in the book of Revelation. If we had the time, we'd do that today, but I'm sure you've done some study there already. But I want you to see that not only does he give us an inheritance, he is our inheritance. 
in, a, in an amazing way that we can't really comprehend right now. This one who the songwriter says is the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. This one of whom the Apostle Peter writes to say that Christ is precious or esteemed to the highest degree possible. This is our inheritance. Everything else about heaven is going to be secondary to Christ because Jesus is what makes heaven, heaven. That's why in Lamentations 3, the, the prophet says, The Lord is my inheritance. I will hope in him. Amen. So believers have an inheritance from God. It's out of this world, over the top, super abundantly, exceedingly fantastic, beyond anything else we have ever been able to think about, imagine, or that we have experienced in our earthly existence here. But verse 17 goes on to call us joint heirs, or fellow heirs, with Christ, which tells us that not only do believers have an inheritance from God, listen, believers share that inheritance with God. 17, if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs, or fellow heirs, with Christ. Now, in this section on adoption, Paul has been using Roman law and custom to describe our adoption into God's forever family. You see, in Jewish tradition, the eldest son normally received a double portion of his father's inheritance. In Roman society, all children typically received equal shares. This equality of inheritance is what each of us can look forward to and will be able to claim in heaven because we, Colossians 1, 12 says, we share in the inheritance of his people in the kingdom of light. So listen, in heavenly math, every heir of faith receives the same share as every other. But it's even more than that, friend, because an inheritance down here involves a one-time distribution of a limited endowment. Once it's been distributed, once it's been divided, there's nothing left. But since God's resources are limitless and heaven is eternal, our inheritance up there knows absolutely no bounds. Each of us will receive all that there is, the full promised inheritance, and the supply will never dwindle, diminish, or decrease. So again, it's, it's beyond our, our ability to comprehend, but it's not beyond our ability to express gratitude and, and, and thanksgiving to God and to live our life differently because of it. You know, the Bible says that God has given to us every good and perfect gift. He's given to us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So he's already started with the blessing, but it's going to get better, my friends. It's going to get even better. I want you to hold your place here for a moment. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I just mentioned about the, the spiritual blessings that are ours. That's from Ephesians 1, verse 3. I want to read verse 3 and verse 11 in Ephesians chapter 1. So either join me there or listen close. I'll, I'll share what we have here. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There you go. That's the verse I, I quoted a moment ago. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Hebrews 1, 2 says in addition that the Father has appointed Jesus the heir of all things. And because we are fellow heirs, according to what we just read in Romans chapter 8, we are destined to receive what he does. Now this doesn't mean that we intrude on the divine prerogatives of Christ, of course not. And we certainly don't become gods, as some cults teach. But we do receive the blessings and grandeur of heaven, and we get to enjoy the Father's glory forever. It is a glory that is bestowed upon us. We, not, we don't earn it. But we share it because we belong to God through faith in Christ. And we are joint heirs with the Son. I want to do some more reading about this. And, and the Lord Jesus talked about this in John chapter 7. In fact, I think the Gospel of John might be my favorite Gospel. I think that's the first time I've ever said that. But you heard it first here. I love the Gospel of John. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. But I love... I love the Gospel of John. Listen to the a couple of times we're going to look. 
But I want you to see John 17, verses 20 through 24, okay? John chapter 17, verses 20 through 24, just to give us some more insight on this, this relationship we have with God and the, the Father and the Son and, and the glory that's involved. Here we go. I do not pray for these alone, Jesus said, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Did you get that? I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So this relationship with Christ starts great and just gets greater, just gets better. This, my friends, is the type of inheritance that God has provided for us. It's an inheritance that 1 Peter 1.4 says is imperishable and undefiled, that will not fade away, and is reserved in heaven for us. So the type of inheritance is something that is something you've never experienced before, something we can uh, dream about, think about, read about, but never really fully comprehend until we are in heaven with the Lord and with the saints, enjoying the glory prepared for us. But I want you to see one more thing today, and that's the timing, the timing of our inheritance. Now, it should be obvious, right, that our spiritual inheritance won't be enjoyed until the future. Now, there are many spiritual blessings in this life, right? But our inheritance is something that awaits us yet. That's why Paul talks about this glory in, in the future tense. Maybe we saw that back in Romans 8, verse 18. Um, he says, Are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, we saw in John 17 that Christ has given us a measure of his glory now, so we can be witnesses on earth. But glory in its fullness will not be ours until we get to heaven. Now that goes against a lot of the theology, shallow theology, uh, incorrect theology, I believe, according to my understanding of scripture, of a prosperity, um, everything goes well here and there's no problems and so on. That's not the focus at all. In fact, that's not even, that's not what the scripture talks about. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones gets it right when he says this, true evangelism does not offer some panacea for all the ills in our life in this world. It does not promise to make us perfect in the moment or set the world right. It says rather, in the world you will have tribulation. But fear not, I have overcome the world. That's a good word there from this uh, commentator, pastor. God gives us grace right now and he promises glory to come. Let me say it again. God gives us grace right now and he promises us glory to come. It is grace that takes us through. It is grace that will one day deliver us to the place prepared for us. So the, the glory comes later. And this was certainly the testimony of the heroes of the faith. You know, the, the Bible has a whole chapter on that, right? The faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to need you to turn there with me. I'm making you work today. Um, Hebrews chapter 11. I just want you to see it for yourself. Um, an amazing and a marvelous text. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, and um, we see here several heirs of faith, right? These are heroes, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, or uh, Bible heroes of the faith. And I want to start in verse 4, okay? Hebrews 11, 4. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it he, being dead, still speaks. Now Abel was accounted righteous, we see this right, by his faith, but he was murdered by his own brother because of that faith, because of his righteousness. There's no earthly inheritance for this heir. He didn't even live long enough to enjoy something like that. Look at the next verse. By faith Enoch was taken away, so that he, he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, if you know other things about the life of Enoch, you know that he was a faithful preacher 
who proclaimed judgment over a 300-year period uh, leading up to the Genesis flood, but without a single convert. Now, he walked with the Lord, and God took him in a, in a marvelous way that we're still talking about and studying today, right? But he didn't have a great and wonderful, prosperous life. No, he had something in the future he was looking toward. How about faithful Noah? We read about him in verse 7 of Hebrews 11. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Amen. He was a man of faith. But he lost everything in the flood. He, he came out escaping with his life and his immediate family only. That's not prosperity. But he wasn't looking for prosperity. Now, we can't take the time to read every example. I think one time I read this, probably, I think it's between 35 and 40 different heroes of the faith mentioned. But, you know, Isaac and Jacob lived with Abraham in tents. And Joseph, though he ended up the number two man under Pharaoh, suffered the loss of family and freedom on the way there. And his advancement in earthly things was never what he expected, asked for, or wanted. You will not find Joseph pining after the things of this life. God gave him a measure of that, but only after suffering. Listen, suffering in more ways than probably any of us have ever suffered. But that was never it. It didn't turn his head. He didn't care about the baubles of this world. His eyes were in the future, like every true heir of God. On his deathbed, he said, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. Up from here to where? To the promised land. Joseph was living for the future with his eyes on the prize of the upward call of God. That's, that's what matters. Moses, Rahab, Gideon, um, Barak, uh, Samson, David, Samuel, they had the same experience. They died without having received the promised inheritance. Because the inheritance comes later. Now, I want to read a few more verses to make this really clear. Hebrews 11, verses 13 to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's powerful. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Don't tell me that people who live for the Lord have flower-strewn pathways all the way through and, and no problems, and they're, they're happy and healthy. And Listen, it's not, it's not true. It didn't happen to didn't happen to anyone in Scripture. There was measure of prosperity and wealth for some individuals, but it was never about that. That's not what was promised to them. That's not what they cared about. They were looking forward. They were looking upward. They were looking to a city not made with hands, eternal in the heavenlies, because that's where our inheritance awaits us. A couple more verses, 35 to 40. Women received their dead raised to life again. But others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. You know, a lot of those guys that you watch on the TV that are promising all this stuff, they're not using, they're not using scripture, they're not handling scripture properly. This is clear, and this is all of these it says. Please, use the scripture and not some personality, some person with a following and, and uh, uh, an agenda. Follow Christ. Follow scripture. Check it out for yourself, brothers and sisters, friends, listeners. Check it out for yourself and you will see this. With this history in mind, and because Paul was divinely inspired by the Spirit of God, 
in the text that we looked at today, right, he brings suffering into the mix in a message about glory. Who does that? You won't get that. You won't get that from, from the TV preachers. Not most of them. He brings suffering into the mix, and that's why he's talking about being heirs of God. But then he says in verse 17, indeed, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. He talks about the sufferings of this present time again in verse 18. Listen, Christ never raised any false hopes among his disciples. He told them what they should expect as followers, and it wasn't a pretty picture. Deny yourself, he said. Take up your cross daily and follow me, he said. In the world you shall have tribulation, he said. So verse 17 ends with a statement that, listen, this is important, present suffering for Christ is the path to future glory. It's the path to future glory because it says we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified together. Suffering for Jesus is part of the Christian life then. 2 Timothy 3.12 says all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What does the word all mean to you? This is our calling. Listen to John 15, 18-21. I promised we'd come back to John John 15, 18 to 21. Again, really good stuff here. Jesus is speaking again. So let's, let's listen up, right? John 15, 18 to 21. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Clear, isn't it? That's the message of Scripture. There is suffering in this world. There is suffering. There are trials. There are tribulations. You, it will cost you something to follow Christ. It's not that just, you know, wearing a different uh, suit. I'll, I'll wear my Jesus suit today. No, you can't do that. It's all or nothing. You're in or you're not in. And the Lord says that, that we put our hand to the plow and we're looking forward to him. We don't look back, but we stay the course. We endure to the end. That's what God tells us to do. But because of this, we are in the greatest company of all. We are in the company of Christ and the saints of God from the past. Paul says later in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection, oh, we like that part, and, he says, the fellowship of his sufferings. My desire, he said, is to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. This is the fellowship of the saints, my friends. Suffering now, glory later. But praise God, I want you to see a couple things, our future glory will be greater than our present sufferings. This inheritance that we have, that we're looking forward to, speaks of glory, and the glory that will come far surpasses the sufferings that we experience now. We saw that in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The words, I reckon, speak of a settled conclusion after careful study and reasoning. Paul has come to realize, Paul has had the revelation of God in, in concert with scriptures that he had and with his own experience that suffering for Christ is insignificant in light of future glory. He says it's not even worth comparing, which is an expression that translates a Greek word that means weighty or a great substance. Here's what he's saying. This is cool. The coming glory is so substantial that every problem we face on the way is as light as a feather in comparison. You may be going through stuff far worse than me. You, you probably are. There's people who suffer greatly. And, and think about those of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world, right? But even that is nothing in, in comparison to the glory which is to come. This is an eternal glory that Corinthians says outweighs all of our problems and trials. Now just think about what God is promising us here, friends. 
Man's original glory as the pinnacle of God's creation, made in his own image, was squandered by Adam's sin and lost to a great degree in the fall that resulted. Man was made to have dominion. Instead, he ends up being controlled. This was not what God wanted for the human race. In conversion, this glory is partially restored. In heaven, it will be fully restored and magnified. Because in the age to come, we will rule the world with Christ, as several scriptures attest. Yes, future glory is greater. Greater. But it's also guaranteed. And, and I, I talk about this a lot, don't I? But I want you to see how important it is to know that we have salvation, not probation. Everlasting life, if you could lose it, is by definition not everlasting. And we see here that we need to make it through because God has started to work. Well, let me borrow from a future study. Uh, it, let me say this. It's guaranteed because of grace. Future glory is guaranteed because of present grace. And I see in verse 30, and again, we'll speak on this more when we come to it in a week or so. But he says, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Uh, it's fascinating that they're all given in the past tense as, as fate accompli, right? It's, it's done. It's been given. It's been completed. We'll delve into that more in the future. But I want you to see that these wonderful words present the various aspects of our salvation. Justification, predestination, uh, sanctification, glorification, right? These are, these are all uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, verbiage, the, uh, the words that speak of, of our redemptive experience. They expre express different parts of it, but listen, they are completely inseparable. Taken together, and they must be taken together, they, they weave a seamless fabric of God's sovereign work on man's behalf. Justification is the beginning of our salvation, and glorification is its completion. Now, if you could lose your salvation at any time in between, it would abort the whole process. You would unborn yourself. Now, think about that. Recognize how foolish, how impossible. How illogical that is. You see, once the work of salvation has begun, it cannot be stopped. It won't be stopped by God. He cannot deny himself. He's told us that. It won't be stopped, can't be stopped by you or by anyone. No one can snatch you out of God's hand. And that's why we share the assurance of Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, my friend, it's not about you. Stop making it about you and, and, and how you perform after you're, after you're saved and, and try to stay saved and stay in the good graces. That, that's a total misunderstanding of salvation. It makes it about you and not God. It takes uh, his sovereignty away. This is the, the work of God. He births us. He seeks us. He chose us before there was an us, and then he sought us, and he birthed us, and he gave us everlasting life, and he seated us in the heavenlies already, and we are glorified positionally. That's the scripture's clear message. So tell me now that I can do something that would put the brakes on the whole thing. Shutter it. Remove it. No. No, it's not happening. It's not what the Bible says at all. Listen, you've got God's word on it here, my friends. Take it to heart and put this in your life. Live in grace, brother and sister, because you are bound for glory someday, a glory beyond anything you could ever imagine. And I'm praying that this truth, this understanding that God gives us today from these two important verses will take you through any suffering and every problem and every question that you may have right now and give you the peace in your heart and the hope in your, in your experience, the spring in your step, the smile on your face, twinkle in your eye, that God, who began a good work in you, will complete it. Amen. Let's make sure we're living for the Lord as we're bound for glory. See you again next time.